Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of conference. This panel, we have three papers. Uh, the first one entitled <coughs> Hybrid Warfare, Local Militias and Foreign States. Before we go through the papers, we have to first of all uh, get some idea of uh, hybrid warfare. First of all, ir irregular army units, which are the units who do not follow the army organization rules and regulations and do not follow military command structure and they are not well known for their discipline which the modern armies are known for. There are the Fidaiin, the guerrilla warfare uh, uh, members, uh, mercenaries, armed bands <coughs> and paramilitary organizations. The fighting for these groups is based on skirmishes, uh, quick raids, uh, targeting strategic strategic uh, targets, uh, and uh, guerrilla warfare and hit and run operations. The hybrid warfare now is a modern version of guerrilla warfare whereby uh, advanced weapon systems are used, but within the tactics of guerrilla warfare. It's called asymmetrical warfare. This kind of warfare can involve chemical, nuclear, biological, and uh, radioactive materials, NRCB, and, uh, OK, and uh, information warfare or um, and it can combine uh, terrorist uh, tactics and guerrilla warfare the the hybrid warfare also can uh, be combined with uh, other forms of warfare employed by by like Switzerland and Iran, for example, they have the regular army and the revolutionary guard force. This kind of wars can also be waged by major power through proxies and with the, uh, and uh, it can also be called a strategic investment in the security of a country, but with lesser cost. This is the fourth generation of warfare. It employs military, political, and social principles, and uh, also it uh, tries to apply pressure on the enemy until uh, enough support is gathered, this will be coupled with uh, media coverage. This uh, asymmetrical warfare can have other features like using light weaponry, secondly, uh, using uh, modern communication systems for uh, purposes of command and control and eavesdropping on the enemy. Also, uh, number three, to infiltrate uh, the local population and live amongst them and mix with them. And also number four, uh, strategic coordination and uh, alliances with outside powers and uh, provide medical, strategic, and other uh, kinds of support. Number five, using uh, terrorizing uh, tactics and killing civilians en masse to intimidate and frighten them. Now, Dr. Anthony Cimenti, 
will be presenting this paper, which is entitled The UAE and Proxy Warfare in Yemen, the Political and Military Role of uh, Armed Non-State Surrogates. The United Arab Emirates uh, has uh, employed and uh, recruited groups in South Yemen, armed and financed them to develop their uh, uh, fighting capabilities like the Shabwani elite force and Hadrami elite force and the security belt uh, forces to enable them to fight against the Houthis and the legitimate Yemeni government forces together. Um, Dr. Anthony Cimenti holds a PhD from Durham University, and he taught there, and uh, uh, his main research interests is on civil military relations and the fragmentation of state power. All right, so <clears throat> today what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna discuss the rise of armed non-state actors in the case of Yemen with an emphasis on the role of United Arab Emirates and how they um, provided support to the elite forces in addition to the security belt forces and what are the strategic implications of that. And so the way this presentation will essentially go is um, I'll discuss the political will of the UAE um, and their desire to have subservient um, militias within southern Yemen and then go on to discuss how they nurtured these relationships with the local militias and how the nature of support that they provided, both qualitative and quantitative, enabled the militia to perform militarily in addition to how particularly the, secu uh, the Southern Traditional Council was able to grow into um, a strong political um, entity. And then this will end by um, sort of dis having a little broad discussion in terms of how um, the United Arab Emirates was directly involved in enabling the revolution of combat um, and political capabilities of their um, sub-state actors. So I'd like to just first briefly say that um, when I think about these militia, and I, I think about it in the case of Yemen, okay, sorry, uh, when I think about it in the case of Yemen, the militia, um, in all instances across the Middle East, they have more pronounced power when the state's in decline. And so what we saw essentially with regards to Yemen is you saw the collapse of the barbarian state. The state in Yemen no longer has a legitimate monopoly of violence. And in addition to that, you saw the collapse of this neo-patrimonial system that Ali Abdullah Saleh had. So now, the way I look at it theoretically is everything has collapsed and we now have this framework in which we can look at how these various actors are operating and fighting each other within this political field. And so uh, beyond that, another important thing to note is that there is a dyadic relationship between the Emirati militia on the one hand and the other forces that they're fighting on the other because there's not one force um, that is purely dominant in terms of, of military capabilities. It's, it, it, there's a relatively um, uh, even relationship between them in terms of the capacities they have. So then the two main arguments um, that answer the research question of how these combat capacities and political performance have been developed is, one is that these capacities are directly related to Emirati patronage and support. And not only that, but foreign patronage and the distribution of that patronage plays an important role in providing the actors across Yemen with the armed strength necessary uh, to persecute the war. The second and, and, and theoretical component is the fact that you've had the collapse of the barbarian state. The Yemeni military no longer has, and arguably maybe never did, wield that monopoly of violence. So then, then this environment then enables what Charles Tilly talked about in terms of state making and war making. They're now, these actors are fighting each other and they're fighting to rebuild the state. So that's the theoretical um, component. Now in terms of the Emirati political will, um, it, it's focused on the fact that uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed redefined Emirati nationalism as military muscle flexing. And part of this was getting involved in Operation Decisive Storm. And this um, intersects with um, sort of an economic policy and a security policy that's focused on creating militia within the South that will enable the Emiratis to, to expand their, their geostrategic interests in the Bab al Mandeb, which is important for the transit of goods from East Africa um, and Asia up, up into Europe. And, and you've seen that, you know, 
they've also done this with regards to the Horn of Africa. They've established um, assets within um, Eritrea in addition to Puntland and Somaliland. So there's been a, a pattern of the Emiratis um, trying to build um, subservient forces to protect their economic interests. So that's the political will that the Emiratis have essentially is, is what they want to do. Now when they went in there and they built these forces, the Hadrami elite forces, in addition to the security belt forces, they had a framework that focused on two things. The first thing is that they did not want warlordism to occur, which they had experienced in Libya, right? So what you essentially need is you need a subservient force that has a coherent chain of command that will be loyal to the Emiratis. The second factor is that they desired, they desired to emulate the United States in Operation Inherent um, Resolve. And what I mean by that is they, they wanted to build these militia into infantry forces. And when you have an infantry, infantry force, they can then um, succeed on the battlefield when provided with what's called key enablers, which means intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, human intelligence regarding the enemy, enemy, um, enemy opposition, opposition forces, um, logistics, the provision of weapons and ammunitions, and all these things. So that's, so that was basically what they um, desired to do and how they desired to set up these militias. So then they went about setting up the security belt forces, and and the individuals in the security belt forces were drawn from Abiyan, Lahish, and Dale, uh, Dahle, while the Hadrami uh, and Shabwani elite forces were drawn respectively from those two provinces, and. It's important to note that when the Emiratis established these forces, they, they emulated um, this notion of like the British protectorates and how the British had established these militias um, in, in each governorate um, or protector rather that they had. And then those militias um, were then, were then, they could be under the control of the United Kingdom. And so that's sort of how they laid that out. And so circa 2016, you had the Hadrami elite forces. They were formed to take part in the Battle of Mukalla to reclaim that from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. That was a force of 12,000, roughly three and a half you know, or so brigades. Equally, the Shabwani elite forces were formed in that same year, and they were formed about 6,000 soldiers. Now, importantly, in April of 2017, um, this is when the Southern Ch um, Transitional Council emerges after um, President Hadi sacks uh, Adros al-Zubaydi, who had been the governor of Aden. And he goes on to create the Southern Transitional Council with members of other governments um, across the South. And then with the help of uh, a Salafist named Hani bin Breck, they're essentially able to form the security belt forces. So you see that you have the political formation of the STC necessitates the formation of the, of, uh, of the security belt forces. And this is where you see this political aspect form and then the corresponding coercive center um, that they have. And so uh, essentially, um, again, to recall, the Emiratis desired to train the Yemenis, the, their subservient forces, so that they could, they could fight as an entry, ent infantry force and succeed in combat with these key enablers. Um, additionally, they desired to instill upon them a sense of discipline and have this coherent chain of command. So initially, these soldiers were, were, were trained in Abbas, um, they were formed, uh, trained in Eritrea. They were also trained on the, the Saudi side of the border in Hadramad, and then in the United Arab Emirates. And then additionally, um, successive bases were set up within Yemen that were captured and they were used to train. These soldiers underwent a 70 day, 10 week um, training course. It's essentially equivalent to if anybody here has served in the military, it's basic training. Um, and what this essentially entails is they learn how to use a weapon, they learn fire and maneuver. Um, a lot of these individuals, because the Emiratis provided armored personnel carriers, they will learn how to dismount an APC and then go on to um, fire and maneuver or provide um, effective fire. They also learned, though, again, how to adhere to the chain of command. And this was instilled using, um, you know, marching drills and discipline and, and things of that nature. More importantly, however, what the Emiratis did is they really made sure that everyone that they recruited um, was aligned with this ideology of resurrecting a southern military. Um, and this is why, you know, you see a lot of these individuals, their patches um, have the old PDRY flag, and it provides them with a sense of esprit de corps. Um, and this common, um, it, it provides unit cohesion and it helps them fight for a higher cause than, than you know, they, they otherwise wouldn't without this sense of, um, sort of nationalism. 
So there was a myriad amount of equipment provided um, to these uh, forces. Um, notice, noticeably, you'll see there the armored personnel carriers, um, the mine resistant um, armored personnel carriers. Uh, they also provided small arms and, and light weapons because even though the even though the Yemeni tribesmen are very well armed, they're armed with Soviet era weapons, and so the Emiratis would buy weapons from other countries and then um, ship them through maritime routes into Yemen. And so they would have um, Serbian machine guns, Belgian machine guns, and <clears throat> things of that nature. So when it comes to the nature of support, this is fundamental. And this, is, this aspect of support is what, in my opinion, is, has allowed the militia um, to, to, to flourish and, and to gain power, they undo power they other, otherwise would not have had. The Emiratis provide all the soldiers with $800 a month, and this salary exceeds the amount of money that you would um, normally get from working with the, the proper Yemeni government. Um, operationally, there are members of the Yemeni, um, the Emirati Special Forces that are embedded within all units of the militia, whether it's the elite forces or the um, security belt forces. And what this essentially enables them to do is help them coordinate operations, help them call in close air supports. Um, and they can fly drones to do intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So it's having that embedded advisory role that you would see um, in like conventional special forces carry out that really has enabled the um, these these uh, militias, these subservient militias, to flourish. The other important thing is that in comparison to Saudi Arabia, um, and a number of, of NATO officials have, that have said this much, the Emiratis are one of the very few militaries within the Middle East that are capable of effectively operating to NATO standards. And this this means that you know when they, when these guys on the ground are going to call in close air support, they know that either the helicopter or the airplane is going to hit directly on the target, and that's, it, it, you know, it's very important because we've obviously seen that sometimes even with guided munitions, they'll miss the target, and that will result in civilian casualties. In terms of operational command and control, the Emiratis um, are in full control of all the forces. Um, President Hadi would de facto stamp, um, you know, approval of the officers, but they all answer up their chain of command, whether the Hadrami. The Shabwani, they have uh, distinct commands there, but it goes up to the UAE. And then you have the security belt forces that goes from there to the Southern Traditional Council up into the Emiratis. And as a whole, they have this, uh, this sort of relationship. So when you look at the strategic implications of this, um, it's obvious. And what's obvious is that because of the weakness of the Yemeni state, foreign powers are able to penetrate and they're able to form their own proxies that will do their own bidding. And this is not just the Emirates, this is Saudi Arabia attempts uh, to, f to help um, President Hadi. You have the Iranians who are with the Houthis. So there's not one organization, and they're never, they're, there's always been organizations that have influenced the civil military relationship and the dispensation of power um, within Yemen. And because of now the introduction of these armed non-state actors, you see the Southern Traditional Council, um, has gained a lot of prominence, and they've established um, not necessarily bases, but sort of um, diplomatic um, postings outside of Yemen. And all of this has is, is been enabled by the Emirati support. And even though the Riyadh Agreement was supposed to put nominal control of the the nominal control of the um, of the security belt forces under Saudi Arabia, these forces all remain loyal to the United Arab Emirates. And I think that, that the just this overall, I think that Yemen exemplifies the broader trend that's been going on across the Middle East, and that's when you have the collapse of the barbarian state and the collapse of the central authority, this gives rise to militias, and this is why you see in Yemen, my opinion is that the Southern Traditional Council and their associated security belt forces will continue to um, to stymie the, the, any kind of emergence of a coherent political entity within Yemen, and they will most likely um, develop into something similar to Hezbollah or the popular mobilization forces in terms of you have a very strong and coherent non-state actor that, um, that is able to dilute the power of the central authority and act on its own accord. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anthony.
Now our next speaker is uh, Mr. Gotok Sonmez. His paper is entitled Foreign Shiite Fighters in the Syrian Civil War, Actors, Recruitment, Strategies, and Iran's Regional Role. The Iranian proxy war has uh, attracted increasing attention and because of Iran's attempts to enhance and spread its influence through proxy uh, powers, Syria has become the field of operations, uh, was the more uh, apparent example of Iranian influence. This uh, paper discusses how Iran has charted for itself a border transcending policy and also Iran's regional ambitions after the Islamic Revolution and its role in the Syrian uh, conflict and how Iran has become an active uh, uh, power in this uh, conflict. Uh, Dr. Uh, Goktok Sonmez is Director of Security Studies, Middle East and Studies Center, or SAM. He obtained his PhD in politics from School of Oriental and African Studies, SAWAS, in London. And uh, his research areas are radicalization and violent extremism, non-state armed actors, Turkish foreign policy, and energy politics. Please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for the kind invitation and thanks for the organizers for this great event and especially Omar Ashur for inviting us here and giving this opportunity to have a fruitful discussion in quite important matters in a timely manner. I'm echoing, I guess. Is it fine now? No. Okay, thank you. So the title of my presentation will be The Foreign Shia Fighters. No. That's much better, right? need my freedom here to walk as well because I'm the guy who walks the walk and talks the talk so it's much better for me actually to have this freedom here. So I'll first talk about the concept of gross round politics, a Carl Schmitt's conceptualization actually and then the Syrian experience or laboratory in terms of proxy warfare and after that I'll briefly talk about some of the leading groups in terms of this concept of axis of resistance and some Iraqi groups, some like Afghan and Pakistani groups, and also Hezbollah as well. And then I will briefly talk about online and offline recruitment tools and some symbols. Sure, yeah. And then I will also put some questions in my last slide in terms of some questions for future research as well as my conclusions. So. First, to begin with, this Carl Schmitt's concept of gross Rome politics. There are three components, actually, which mainly refers to the Nazi Lebensraum and Ein Volk, Ein Rach ideologies, actually, or, or goals. First, the state as the core of this ideology. Then we have the idea, which represents the state mechanism and also keeps the state strong and dynamic in terms of idea ideationally, actually. And we need a geographical belt in which the state tries to expand its influence and strengthen its position. So if we apply this concept to the Iranian context, actually, we have the state mechanism with an ideological euphoria, and the idea is not only the Shia system of thought, but also the idea of axis of resistance. And the geographical belt is not only the Middle East, but also including 
some parts of Africa in order to export the revolution and this can be done by proxies or direct involvement. So we can keep this conceptualization in mind while we are moving towards the groups Iran was channeling towards Syria. So the two quite important actors, as you know, IRGC and the Kudus Force, in terms of the legal basis of the IRGC, there is an important part within the Article 150 of the Iranian Constitution, which is the role of protecting the revolution and its achievements. So quite a blurred concept and quite a vague concept, actually. So you can see no geographical boundaries. And even though the primary objective is the protection of the revolution, the actions the IRGC can carry out, ranging from construction to, to, to cultural and agricultural activities. And we are talking about quite a high number of forces on the ground. Within the context of the Kudus force, as a subunit of the Revolutionary Guards. And as we know, the, the late Qasem Soleimani and now the Ismail Khani was, is leading the force. We are talking about 15,000 to 20,000 strong force and it is responsible for the military activities outside Iran actually. And they take their military and intelligence training in Shiraz and Tehran and religious education and indoctrination in the city of Qum, which is quite famous nowadays because of this coronavirus as well. And these photos are telling a lot of things, actually. The acts of resistance, you know, there is, you can see the ranking from the Iranian eyes, but this photo is also quite important. You can see the flags of Zainab Union, Fatimi Union, Hamas, which is also important, even though as a Sunni actor, the Hashid and Sarullah and Hezbollah as well. So, and in, in the front, you can see Suleimani's photo, while the aerospace commander, Ali Hajizadeh, was making his speech about the revenge of Suleimani. And the engagement in Syria, the Iranian engagement, is the peak point of the Iranian, actually, activism within the context of the Arab Spring and proxy warfare. So the argument was that the Syrian uprisings are like all the Arab uprisings, an instigation of the West, so it should be defied by Iran, and the regimes should be defended. And the fear is that not only the Syrian regime can be fallen, but also the Iraqi regime can fall as well because they were already suffering from ISIS and also problematic relations between Baghdad and Erbil. And the goal was, therefore, to keep the regime alive in Syria, which will also prevent some threats going to Iraq and affecting Iraqi regime as well. So we can see in the Syrian context or Syrian experience, Syrian laboratory, I want to call it like that, integrated and multilinguistic proxy warfare. So a comprehensive approach to proxy warfare is the peak point of this strategy and its use. So we also see a growing Iranian role. It's not only about the military role and political role, but also diplomatically, Iran, Iran succeeded in persuading the international actors to see Iran as a must actor within the uh, context of settlement in the Syrian crisis. So I also looked into the evolution of Iranian military strategy in Syria, actually. First, it started with the people's committees, transforming them into national defense forces. Then Iran realized that uh, there is a lack of capabilities and also the opposition continue its advance. So we, are, we, see, we saw afterwards the direct involvement by the Iranian side. And then with the increasing loss of Iranian lives or Iranian commanders and soldiers on the ground, then it turned to proxies, actually. So there is this important question, actually. Are these foreign fighters are more expendable than Iranians? It's an important question. And second point, we always talk about this foreign fighter issue from the, like, talking about ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But we see that there is a Shia foreign fighter phenomena. And this phenomena is seen mostly in the case of Syria, actually. And there are numbers. The result of, as a result of this strategic evolution, and we see quite high numbers, not only in terms of the forces on the ground, but also people killed in action. And an important letter in 2017 came from Suleimani to Khamenei. Suleimani was talking about the, the capture of Abu Kamal as the final point of ISIS defeat, or final, like, final point of ISIS defeat, and. He was talking about the sacrifice of foreign fighters. And in his response, Hamanei was also talking about sacred fighter brothers. And the latter is quite important in terms of these references to foreign fighters. So 
Probably the most important actor here is Hezbollah. I will talk briefly about several actors. I know that there are a lot of them, but in May 2011, Hezbollah announced their support and the early involvement was in the form of military advice and support. In time, we saw Hezbollah funerals, especially 2011 and 12, and they were taken to Lebanon. And in 2013, there was an important visit actually by Nasrallah to Tehran to meet Suleimani and Khamenei. After this visit, he was back in Beirut and he declared and announced the presence of Hezbollah on the ground. We can see here some salaries, and when you see the salaries, you can also make a comparison with the coming slides, actually. You'll see that the salaries are diminishing from Hezbollah to Fatimi Yun and Zeynabi Yun, actually. So you can also t t think about this ranking. And you can also see more than 1,000 people or Hezbollah fighters were killed in action, and we are talking about 5,000 injuries just between 2012 and 2016. And the side goal of Hezbollah was also strengthened its presence in, in the Golan Heights. In terms of military involvement, there are some important cases where we can see Hezbollah presence, which is Al-Qusayr, Kalamun, Aleppo, Zehra, Nubul, Dera, Sheikh Meskin, and so on and so forth. When we look at the Afghan dimension, we can see the Fatimi Yun Brigades, and the reason why the Fatimi Yun Brigades were in the ground, actually on the ground, was the rise of ISIS, and subsequent shortcomings or shortage of human resources from Iraq actually. So the Fatimi Brigade is built on a previous experience of proxy warfare from the Iran-Iraq war because there was then again Hazara Afghans in the ranks of the Iranian army. The commander is Ali Reza Tavassoli, late Ali Reza Tavassoli, and his background is also quite linked with the revolution in Iran and IRGC. I'm not going into too much detail, but you can see some of his links to the structure, actually. So the human resource is mostly composed of the Afghan refugees, actually, in Iran, which is around three million, and only one third of them are leg legally migrant. So the amendment to the citizenship law is quite important in 2016, which also granted these Afghans and Pakistanis who killed in Syria with the, the, the right to citizenship. So there are three important motivations actually. First, salary. Salaries are quite good, but not as good as the Hezbollah's one. And the sectarian motivations, and the third one is the citizenship for themselves and also for their families, and also some other benefits in terms of housing, etc. And we saw some funeral ceremonies for the Afghan fighters killed in action, and we saw uniform, uniformed revolutionary guards and also the emblems of the Martyrs and Veterans Affairs Foundation of Iran. And when we look at the Pakistani dimension, we saw that one of the reasons of this Pakistan dimension actually is the sectarian tension within Pakistan. And Shia is around like 20-25% of Pakistan and they suffered from like 10, around 10,000 losses of life in the last 30 years. And their entrance is 2013, 2014 to, to Syria. The force is mostly composed of Pakistani Shis from the Turi tribe and also Hazaras from the region of Keta. So we are talking about more than like 150 losses out of 1,000 forces. And compared to Hezbollah and Fatimi Yun, we are now talking about a relatively low profile, as you can also see from the numbers. In, ter in terms of symbolism, the defense of Sayyid Zeynep Shrine and also Imam Hassan Mosque are quite important. We will get back to that when we are talking about recruitment strategies, the symbolism. And according to inter an interrogation actually with a Pakistani fighter, it's quite important to see this amount of salary actually. So you can see the ranking between the salaries. So I'll keep it quite short actually from now on. Ina made a great presentation on the Hashid, so I won't go into too much detail, but only to see some active groups, we can see that Mujeba is quite active, Ketaib is quite active as well, Asaib and Badr organization is quite active, and all of them announced their presence on the ground in 2013, so they are quite open in terms of their involvement in the Syrian crisis and their fighters. Within the context of organizing such a force from Iraq, of course, the most important part is the experience with the emergence of the Hashid, actually. And 
An important question, I will ask that in the final slide as well, but the unifier effect or rally around the flag effect of the Suleimani's assassination, will it be permanent or just, just a temporary thing? We can think about this as well. And in terms of recruitment tools and symbols, so we can see an excessive use of Facebook, YouTube, and after 2016, especially Telegram actually. The defense of Sayyida Zeynep Shrine is a quite important symbol for all the Shia coming from all over the world to the Syrian theater. And you can see in several websites, but most of them are done right now, you can see some phone numbers, some information forms, and also quite a strong sense of symbolism, actually. One of the examples what was the use of uh, Mohammed Bakir al Sadr photo with the Hamanei and also a telephone number. And from like mid 2014, there's an increase in terms of the number of YouTube videos. And also, if the group has a TV channel, it also uses these kind of like videos first on YouTube, then its TV channel, as in the case of the Better Organization and Al Qadir TV. In these online forms, there are questions about the, the family ties and all that stuff, but then you can be, uh, you can have a telephone interview as well. So I'll just cut it short from now on, and I can talk about some like physical recruitment tools. Actually, one of them was the offices in Kabul and Herat in Afghanistan, and one of them was Al Mustafa University in the city of Qum, which was channeling the Pakistani students to the conflict zone. And this uh, visual is quite important in terms of the symbolism. You can see the. You cannot see it. You can see the Sayyida Zeynep Shrine here. That must be Cem Keran Mosque. And even though it's a Fatimi Union fighter killed in action, and you can see the Fatimi Union flag, but in the right corner, you can also see Sipahi Zeynep Union Telegram channel. So you can see the organic. And Shahid Mehdi Basri. Uh, I took it from a Twitter account. So if you want, you can also follow. He made a lot of like shares. Uh, both for Zeynep Yun and Fatimi Yun Brigades. So, just to keep this uh, slide here, I'm not going to talk about it because I think I'm run out of my time. So, yeah, the conclusion is Iran is kind of expanding its growth realm, especially after the nuclear deal and relaxation of its funds, which can be channeled to proxies. But this so far successful strategy, is it sustainable is one question. And what will happen if Trump withdraws from the nuclear deal and the because of the relationship between economics and proxy warfare because according to the US State Department estimates Iran is channeling 100 million dollars only to the Sunni groups in Palestine so we can think about this as well and this post Suleiman era yes the assassination was a deterrent factor on the US part but on the other 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 hand it also unified the Hashid and it also made an impact in terms of rally around. Shukran Jazeen. Okay. Shukran Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Osama Kabbar, and his, table, his paper is the militia of the Libyan National Army, and uh, that uh, Khalifa Haftar announced in 2014, and within the campaign of the campaign of dignity or dignity operation. The paper will talk about uh, the fighting capabilities of this uh, army supported by France, the UAE, and Egypt, and later on Russian mercenaries. And uh, the paper also reveals the alliances between local warlords and outside support, Salafi uh, units and others in Libya. Uh, Mr. Osama Kabbar is an expert uh, at the uh, strategic center of the Qatar Armed Forces, specializing in Middle Eastern affairs and Libyan affairs in particular. Now the floor is used. 
Thank you very much. May the peace of God be upon you all. So this presentation is going to concentrate on one particular side when it comes to the military scene in uh, Libya because we need to be very clear and objective. So I'm going to talk about Haftar in particular. I'm not going to talk about anything else. So the presentation before you, I'm going to have an introduction and I'm going to give you an outline or an idea about the Libyan army uh, during the previous regime and then the political operation in Libya, how we reached the Al-Karama operation or dignity operation and also the intervention of Haftar. And I would like to give you an idea about Haftar as a man of military coups and also an explanation. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. I would like to talk about uh, Al Karama operation. Uh, this is the dignity operation. And after that, the makeup of the Haftar forces. And after that, I'm going to end my presentation with a conclusion. So, the military operation in Libya after the victory of the revolution in Libya in October 2011, Libya has entered into a democratic pathway that has led to three elections, popular elections that have been convened. We have had the National Congress, which is the legislative component. And after that, we have had the Constituent Committee for the writing of the Constitution. And after that, we have had the democratic elections that have been observed by the United Nations and that were very fair. And after that, we have had the parliamentary elections in May uh, 2014 and since October 2011 and despite uh, a number of violations but the transition that took place in Libya was uh, in a very in uh, flowed uh, very well and uh, there were some I mean conflicts between different political parties at the time as well so in 2014 and after the elections in Libyan parliament, so uh, we have seen that there was a challenge to the results that have been reached and uh, the uh, court annulled the, the outcomes of the elections. This was based on a constitutional declaration and this was in contradiction with the law and here started the problem in Libya. Excuse me, if you have a problem, it's not in And after that, the Supreme Court was cancelled. And after that, we had the National Congress. So it was not easy to leave Libya in a political vacuum. So the international community uh, so uh, rejected the not to deal directly with the constitutional decision in Libya, and it was stalling uh, the decision or the resolution that uh, was reached. And uh, here we have seen this uh, uh, conflict between the two entities. And after that, we had a political operation that took place in Sherat in Morocco, which included the National Congress and also the Libyan Parliament, and has led to uh, led to the uh, political solution in the government of Sarraj that was internationally recognized. And also, there was a Security Council resolution as a representative, as a legitimate representative of Libya. 
and parliament re remained as the legitimate body and the Congress was the supreme council of the state that had a number of consultative duties. There are a number of duties uh, pertaining to uh, the approval of the government and certain ministers and that entailed that there should be discussion between parliament and the national Congress. This is very important for us to understand the differences between Sarraj and Haftar. So a Sarraj government is uh, a legitimate uh, government backed by Security Council resolutions, represents Libya in all international arenas. What about the Libyan military? Al Qadhafi was very much interested in building a strong military in Libya and also to have a very strong arsenal that was in the 70s until mid 80s. So there was a strong Libyan army, and that army in 1981 was able to occupy Chad as a whole. It was under the control of Muammar al-Qaddafi. So there were a number of adventures in Africa, in Uganda, and other kind of countries. So he used to send his army in order to support certain military coups at the time. And it had a very, very strong arsenal. So the international adventures of Muammar al-Qaddafi with the Irish army and other liberation movements and so on and so forth. So this had made Libya enter into clash with the, the United States of America in 1986. The United States of America bombarded the house of Muammar al-Qaddafi and other areas, and also Muammar al-Qaddafi was made into international isolation, and this has led into an economic blockade imposed on Libya in 1992, which had a very bad impact on Libya and had made Muammar al-Qaddafi try to find a way out of this uh, uh, blockade, particularly if we know the uh, uh, incident of Panam aircraft uh, where uh, in excess of 270 70 people have been killed and where Muammar al-Qaddafi was accused. So Muammar al-Qaddafi tried to go back to the international scene and there were a number of conditions that have been imposed as a result of that. Amongst the conditions that have been imposed is the disbandment of the uh, Libyan army and uh, uh, Amal al-Qaddafi uh, marginalized the, the army and encouraged the army to leave the army and gave them civil uh, uh, positions and posts. And after that, we have seen a number of security brigades uh, and their doctrine is the protection of the regime and not the state. And those who follow the scene in Libya, they know the Saadi Libya uh, Brigade, uh, Sahaban Brigade, al Mgariyev Brigade, and so on and so forth. All of these are independent kind of brigades and they are not under a kind of a military structure as it is known internationally. So the uh, army in Libya was marginalized at that particular of time. So many of them have resigned and so many of those members are now in the political scene. We have al Jueli today who is the uh, person who orders the operations by Sarraj. He was a captain. He resigned, uh, left the army and after that he took place and participated in the revolution. And after that he became Minister of Defense and he was in charge of the Western area of Libya. Also another person who was a major who resigned, he worked in commerce and after that he participated in the revolution and now he is holding important posts. This is just to underline that the military was disbanded by Muammar al-Qaddafi. So Haftar, the man of coups, of military coups. So Haftar, he participated with Muammar al-Qaddafi in the coup that was carried out against King Idris. He was very much close to Muammar.
Muammar al-Qaddafi. He led the Libyan forces in Chad. He was defeated after that. This happened recently. That was in 1986 uh, when Haftar was defeated in Chad uh, and Libya controlled Chad completely in 1981 and also Haftar was detained and this story is known. And after that Haftar joined the Libyan opposition and he tried to form forces that have been trained in Sudan and tried to enter into Libya with those forces and then he had another attempt through Algeria and this uh, operation also uh, failed and he was also accused of his loyalty uh, with the opposition and he was accused of being a double agent. So when the Libyan revolution started, Haftar came back again. He tried to have a role to play, but uh, he was rejected altogether. So he's... We can't hear what the gentleman is saying, I'm afraid. We do apologize to the ladies and gentlemen listening to the interpretation. We cannot hear what the gentleman is saying. So he was rejected by the revolutionaries. We cannot hear what the gentleman is saying. We do apologize to the ladies and gentlemen listening to the interpretation. So uh, Haftar was rejected by the revolutionaries and even by the military command that was there at the time because Haftar, his loyalty was not known. And secondly, he is a prisoner of war. And as per military rules, as uh, his excellency knows, these people have been defeated in war. So, مش سامعة واطي جدا هذا هذا واطي so عبد الفتاح يونس had been asked to be the uh, commander in chief so with with regard to our brothers, the civilians, we have to know that the military system is So we have to know that the person who comes before you has a precedence. So Abdurrahman Yunus and him, they graduated in the same year, but Haftar uh, was there before him. So, so they brought uh, Jalal al-Dghiri, who was their professor, but he was an old man who was in his 80s. He was brought uh, to uh, solve this matter and uh, he was appointed uh, as Minister of Defense. Uh, so the National Libyan Army was uh, coined at the time and uh, Haftar was given the commander of land forces and he established a brigade which is the National Libyan Brigade and that was in 2011 and he had a number of tanks uh, that included that. So the re revolutionaries, they refused that, they rejected that, and they said, you go to the, if you go to the uh, front lines, uh, you're going to be responded to. So we have Abdel Fattah and Yunus, uh, who was. Uh, who was the order of uh, al saiqa and he established al jaysh al libi the Libyan military. Can you see the difference between the National Army and Haftar uh, 
had also his vehicle. So it was a brigade. We're talking about brigades and not the Libyan National Army. So the countries that have adopted this project, so Al-Karama or Dignity uh, Project, it is a project in order to control Libya and it is not a military movement in order to combat terrorism as Haftar claims. So uh, the uh, Haftar is only a front face and it is a French uh, uh, kind of project. So the Karama operation, as we can see, Haftar tried to carry out the broadcast coup. So he went on the Arabia channel and announced a military coup and a complete control of Libya. And the brigades that he used to control uh, left him. But uh, in May 2014, he had a number of brigades and he announced uh, control and attack uh, on Benghazi to combat uh, the uh, brigades of the revolutionaries. So the makeup of the Haftar forces are, so there are a number of forces that are loyal to Haftar and there are militias. These have different uh, fluctuating kind of uh, allegiances and we have other kind of forces. So we have forces that are loyal to Haftar. So it was him who forced these for uh, who formed these forces, and we have militias. These are mercenaries, and we have uh, forces that are in alliance with Haftar, such as the Popular Front uh, to liberate Libya. So these are the forces that are uh, have been established by uh, Qaddafi them, and also those who are very much close to Al Qaddafi. And these are in alliance with uh, Haftar because their objective is one: is to control Libya and to put an end to the revolution. And if they achieve their objective, there is going to be a conflict between themselves because they are not law loyal to Haftar and they do not accept Haftar to be the president. And we have some external forces such as the Emirates, the Egyptian regime. We have France, we have our brothers from Sudan, the current uh, regime after the revolution. It completely supports Haftar. We have the Janderweed forces and so on and so forth. So the capabilities of Haftar, we have uh, small arms. So we have old Russian aircrafts because, as you know, that in the 90s, uh, Libya was under uh, uh, siege. And when Muammar Gaddafi saw what happened to Saddam Hussein, he gave everything to the Americans, the nuclear, the So the aircrafts were old. The aircrafts have been maintained in Egypt and uh, also uh, to secure uh, regional uh, waters. And also they had a number of uh, tanks, uh, Russian tanks. And uh, Haftar relies uh, at great length on Emirati and Egyptian aircrafts. And these have made a difference in the war of Derna and also in Benghazi. The control was aerial control and also there was a bombardment that was very heavy in those particular areas. So as you can see, الصحوات هذه أو أو الشبيحة كما نعرفه إحنا في 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 سوريا هي هذه من يدعمها بي بتكون معه وخلاص يعني وميليشيات هجينة ما بين جزء منها نظامي وجزء منها صحوات أو جزء منها مستفيد ميليشيات متبدلة الولاء طبعا هذه اللي هي التيار السلفي المدخلي وهذا يأخذ في تعليمات من السعودية التيار السلفي المدخلي طبعا هي قوات هم مدنيين ميليشيات وليست قوات نظامية عسكرية فهو ولاءهم يعني أو, أو تحالفهم مع حفتر من باب تعليمات من السعودية وليس أنهم يؤمنوا بهذا المشروع شكرا أستاذ أسامة الله 
طيب ان شاء الله الساده الحضور نفتح الان باب الاسئله بس رجانا رجانا ان يكون السؤال مباشر دون الحاجه الى مقدمات شكرا جزيلا like you to ask direct questions without any introductions go ahead Thank you very much. I have a small comment and a question to Mr. Osama Al Kabar. You said that the Libyan military was disbanded, and I would like to object to this piece of information because I worked in a UN team. Uh, on Libya, and I carried out many visits to Libya, and I was amongst the members of that team, and we have had 17 conditions, uh, and this is not one of the conditions uh, in 1992. There are a number of details that I do not want to disclose here. Abdel Hamid Dismayam, we have met many times uh, on satellite channels. Uh, and you have not mentioned the Ansar al-Sharia that controlled Benghazi. And you said that there were attempts to occupy Benghazi from the revolutionaries and the revolutionaries. Ansar al-Sharia was designated as a terrorist group. The other point, I was hoping to listen to uh, the matter from a different perspective. You said that you're going to talk about Haftar only, but there were some other details that I really wanted to hear from you. Thank you. هناك مشكلة في الترجمة تم حل المسألة إذا نعتذر لهذه المسألة لدي سؤال للدكتور بولوب قلت إن حزب الله هو موازي ل تنظيم الدولة والقاعدة ما الذي تعني موازي I have a question to Dr. Osama Kaabar you mentioned that Libya defeated Chad in Lebanon, we were in that particular phase. There was a campaign where we have had thousands who have gone from the so many other political parties in cooperation with Ahmed Jibril. And we heard that there were squadrons of Syrian and also there was an ozone that was occupied by Chad. So this is the idea that we have. Second question. When you talked about Haftar and forming a Brigade, he went to the front. To which front? Thank you very much. My question I would like to thank you very much, Mr. Kabar. It seems that. Uh, the Libya is undergoing a new phase, which is after the disbandment of the military and the establishment of the different militias. So how was Haftar able to control? The line was cut. We do apologize to the ladies and gentlemen listening to the interpreting. So why the militias were successful that have been established by Haftar to control all these areas, all such as the oil crescent and so on and so forth. There are There is echo. We do apologize. We hear an echo. We do apologize to the ladies and gentlemen. We do apologize to the ladies and gentlemen. There is an echo in the sound. <coughs> Go ahead.
With regard to the question by Mr. Abdel Hamid, I would hope that you would share the 17 points that you mentioned. What happened in Libya, so the disbandment of the Libyan army happened in the late 80s of the 20th century. We do apologize. We cannot hear the interjection. In 80, 81, 82, I got my primary school certificate, uh, so we 25 students out of 28 joined the army. So what I want to tell you that so many of my friends are officers. They got instructions in the mid 80s to disband the military. And we thought that these instructions have come from outside Libya. Yes. Uh, the military was disbanded. Is it as a result of instructions by the U.S. or uh, by Qaddafi himself? Uh, we do not know. But thank you for correcting the point. Uh, as for Ansar al-Sharia, has been designated by mistake, uh, designated as a terrorist group because all what Ansar al-Sharia did, they refused to enter elections. They did not object or impede the elections. They just didn't want to participate in the elections. So when have Ansar al-Sharia become part of Daesh or ISIS? This was at the end of 2015, begin in 2016. But it was designated in 2014 as a terrorist group. And it was not. It had a number of social activities in Benghazi, and the Benghazi people were not scared of Ansar al-Sharia. As for Uzu, Uzu was a kind of a triangle between Sudan, Chad, and Libya. And there was a conflict between Chad and Libya about this particular matter. And Libya was controlling it. And international arbitration was in favor of Chad. So, and then the Chadian forces and Muammar al-Qaddafi was against it. And then he occupied Chad completely. This is with regard to Uzo. With regard to the Libyan Syrian forces, the Syrian forces, I do not know about the Lebanese. I know that there is a Syrian squadron that was against Libyans. And this Syrian squadron was used in the coup in 1993 that was led by a military command in Bani Luit. And a military camp was bombarded by the Syrian squadron. It was used by Muammar al-Qaddafi in order to defeat any coups or any insurgencies uh, so uh, because no forces libyan forces would kill their uh, own uh, brothers and sisters we have had muammar al-qaddafi he was uh, in trablus uh, particularly in the capital and all his allies were in tarhuna zantan and so on and so forth the eastern part was always in a problem with the uh, other areas such as derna and the green mountain and so on and so forth he did not have a military strong military presence in those areas when the revolution started the, even those camps, uh, small camps, they ran away because they were not militarily supported because the army was marginalized uh, and the security brigades were there to, uh, to support uh, the regime and Muammar and so on and so forth. So he was not allowed to enter the Briga front from Benghazi into Sirt, Masrata, Trablus, uh, Tripoli and so on and so forth. There was the fighting took place. So he was not allowed to enter into those areas. The question, the other question, yes, uh, 
it is not Haftar and the militias of Haftar. It was the Emirates, Egypt, and France, and the aircrafts that were bombarding with limited uh, capabilities of the Wifaq government. So the uh, army and the weapons were very, very traditional. So they did not have the international support until recently by Turkey, when Turkey entered there. But the conflict between 2014 till date in 2020, Al-Wifaq government had been fighting with forces that had only traditional uh, kind of weapons and also the aircrafts are very very limited and after that uh, Wagner had uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, capabilities but they were very very limited indeed uh, who has another question yes go ahead Assalamu alaikum. British Embassy. Uh, Dr. Sommez, I hope I've pronounced your name yep. right there. I'd just like to ask you about the, uh, um, the link, the religious link between uh, the Syria regime and Iran. Uh, is this a marriage of convenience, um, or is it it's often portrayed in the Western media as a Shia Shia thing, but as, as, as we know, Alawis are, are quite different. But do you see it as a significant factor, or is it just a marriage of convenience? Good morning from the Embassy of Mexico. Uh, Dr. Sonmez, uh, thank you very much for your wide and clear-cut, data-full presentation, um, very insightful. Uh, somehow in the same vein of their religious connection, this has to do, you mentioned different items on how to create this uh, cement or to recruit different countries for the Shia. But is it the Shia element that is the principal cement of all these different militias, or is it more the salaries, or is it more the marginalization of ethnic groups, for example, Hassara, or so what is, the, what is the principal cement, or is it the citizenship grants that the Iran regime, because we, if we are talking about Shia groups, is it the Shia, the revolutionary Shiaism that actually cements that, because it is quite successful. I mean, what you presented is like, wow, well, Iran is the new main force of the entire region, Central Asia, Middle East, so I'm, I'm just curious to know from your position, what is the principle? Is it really that the Shia a, a revolutionary element is successful to be exported? And if so, do you believe sustainability? Because already has been many years sustained. So if it keeps like that, maybe it's really sustainable because it's one of your questions at the end. Thank you. Shukran. Fadal. Dr. Jamal Abdel Rahman, researcher. My question is to Dr. Osama Kabar. With regard to the disbanding of the military establishment in Libya, I think that the uh, theory by Qaddafi has helped uh, in this matter, and the military coups that have happened in the 90s and the 80s have contributed to disbandment of the army. And it was not an instruction that came from outside Libya. So this had weakened the army because uh, the army did not, uh, the army was made weak for it not to be an impediment uh, so because the political authority wanted to stay in power this is in comment to the point that was mentioned uh, the forces of Haftar participated with forces from Sudan so this happened before the change of the regime in Sudan uh, so this was for logistical uh, kind of reasons we have had Abdel Wahid movement Manawi movement uh, and they were leading operations in 
in Libya in order to benefit both parties. So Libya made use of insurgent groups uh, from uh, Sudan. And also we cannot forget that also there are other countries that are intervening in this matter from the Emirates and Egypt. But the Darfonians took part with both parties. There are a number of factors that led to the support of Haftar and the tribes played a very important role when it comes to striking balance and distribution of gains. So we start with the answers now. Shukran jazeelan li hadi al asila awrida nabda'a ma al mutahadith hunak. Ashkurukum jazeelan shukran ala asila. What I meant between like while I was talking about the parallels between Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the, the Shia foreign fighters, what I meant was that when we are talking about foreign fighters issue, we mostly refer to the UN Security Council resolutions 2170 and 2178, and we mostly talk about foreign terrorist fighters. But the foreign fighter phenomena is quite old, actually, and we can trace it back to Spanish Civil War and even before, actually. And they both fall into the heading of or title of the use of foreign fighters by non-state armed actors. So I'm not calling all these Shia actors as terrorists. I'm not in, a, uh, not in that position, even though some of them are being like designated as terrorist organizations, but I am just drawing some parallels in terms of recruitment strategies because most of the groups recruiting foreign fighters are using these kind of like symbolism and like providing such salaries in order to attract people and uh, all that stuff. So I was just drawing these this parallels and it was a great question to like help me clarify this point. In terms of the religious link, yeah, from the West I can see that these like sectarian issues are quite blurred compared to how we can see it here. Be because I know this discussion about whether ISIS or Al Qaeda is really Sunni or this or the difference between like Salafi Sunni identities and also differences within the, the Shia as well. I'm not going into too much detail in terms of a theological debate. There I think there are a lot of people who knows these differences much better than me, but yes, there are certain differences between Musairis in Syria and the Velayat Faqih understanding in Iran and also Alawites in Turkey. So I believe that, as you rightly pointed out, it's not not an axis of resistance, but resistance, but mostly an axis of like convenience. It's quite like functional for all the sides there, and it's what matters most, I guess. And within this. Uh, context, the citizenship, salary, and like family benefits are more important, which is why the question, uh, is it sustainable, is important as well, actually. If this nuclear agreement fails after Trump's withdrawal, I know that the European Union countries are quite opposed to this position, but if that fails, we can see a much more like economic problems within the, the ir Iranian economy. If Iran cannot fund this, like, cannot channel these funds, what we can see in the future is, I think, one of the most interesting research questions for some future research. And in my opinion, yeah, these are the pri primary factors, but most people like to believe that it's not that. And all the organizations recruiting foreign fighters need some people who are quite like opportunistic, but some who are quite like pious as well. So there are different like classifications within the organizations. You choose some people for like I don't want to like say this, but you choose some people for like suicide attacks, but some of them for like like organizing some capacities on the ground. So you need all of them, but I think the leading figures are most most like opportunistic. With regard to the disbandment of the uh, Libyan military, yes, I agree with your opinion, but as an eyewitness in Libya. So this is what we had in Libya at the time. There were instructions from outside Libya. And as I told you, I had so many colleagues who were officers and resigned. This is what we had in Libya. But frankly speaking, in the last two days, I tried to find documents that would show that there were some instructions. I couldn't find any. 
I carried out research. I have not done an extensive research, but I haven't found any. Yes, you have a valid point. Yes, there is no point whatsoever. With regard to the participation of forces from both parties, during the Bashir reign, there was logistical support, uh, weapons coming from Sudan to the revolutionaries. So we did not have Sudanese forces or militias. No, up to now, we do not have that. But with regard to Haftar, all the Sudanese militias that you have mentioned, such as the Minawi militias and Abdel Wahid militias, the Janjaweed and so on and so forth, all of them are on the ground, are taking part in the fighting with Haftar. So Bashir was very much supportive of the civil political transition in Libya and militias that are fighting with Haftar. And with regard to the different tribes, so the options that we had in Libya, we opted for a civil democratic state. And these are very much targeting of the points of force because Muammar very much relied on the elders, the leaders of the different tribes, because these are centers of force and power. And when we entered into elections, into the democratic process, we have had three elections that uh, flowed very well. And the elders and leaders of the tribes did not find any role to play in Libya because the system became a civil system. So that is why they concluded alliances with Haftar, not because they loved Haftar. This is a kind of a marriage of convenience for them. So if Saif enters elections in Libya, he is going to be successful because there is still a lot of loyalty from the part of the different tribes to Muammar and the sons of Muammar.